Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see how many people made it back. Let's turn our hymn books to 452. I think we can stay remain seating for this one, My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful, is my Savior's love for me. Verse 3. In pity angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful, is my Savior's love for me. Verse 5. When with the ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see, T'will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful in my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Okay, that's good. Well, this is all the folks that made, found their way back in here. They're making it. Greg, I did not know you got up at three, to, 3 this morning to get here. I don't have any special award to give you, buddy. Official. You didn't get a ticket? Should we ask you how fast you was going? Okay. The appropriate speed is the answer, right? Necessary to get here. Well, I'll tell you what. Where, where were you at? Rebecca's. How far away is that? Wow, you drove that far to get to church today. Well, I'm honored. That's something. Uh, and you stayed awake all the morning service. How are you going to do this next one? No, okay. <laughs> no, it's about that. Wayne and uh, Mickey still out there looking at the drainage lines and everything, probably? I don't mind. If Mickey, I know uh, Mickey's a, a little bit of a contractor himself and building stuff like that. If he can, if he can come up with something to help us for a while, that'd be good. He's got a real nice in-ground swimming pool. When I found out he built that, I was impressed. I mean, I looked at that and said, well, he's 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 pretty talented fella. Well, guess what? Whenever you broadcast service, how fast things can come back. Let's see if I have it here. <clears throat> Brother Larry, at the beginning of service, someone texted and then, Brother Larry, when I was at the, towards the end of the service, and I said, I can't remember the lady's name. I wish I got their name. Well, I was still finishing up the message, so I didn't want to check someone buzzing my phone in my pocket. For your information, the NASA woman you referred to in the sermon is Katherine Johnson. She taught at the old Tazewell County High School in Bluefield, Virginia, in the 1950s before going to NASA. The school was the, the ca county's colored high school I have, I have a couple of stories about it in our paper recently, the Cedar Bluff Times. So I know anything. Okay. I'll tell you what. But it just reminds me, I'll go back and check what the one beginning service. When, when we're broadcasting services, how fast people can check things out and get you information for that. That's good. Um, we're, not, we're not streaming now, are we? We are. Well, brother. Okay, brother Larry, thank you. Okay, you're listening right now. Thank you, Brother Larry. And, and whoever texted at the beginning of the service, I haven't read that one yet, but I'm sure it was pure honoriness. Probably Donna Ham. Okay, anyways, uh, we're, I guess we're ready. Let's sing another hymn. 477 at Calvary. Years 
years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Verse 4. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Thank you. Well, we're turning to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. One message builds upon another a little bit, so this, this is a connection with the morning service and some of the thoughts of it. John 13, and then while you're finding that, let me mention again, I'm saying it again, though the handful is here for the second service is so that folks can hear it that aren't here. We've chosen the week of June 14th through the 19th for the Wild Youth Camp. Young folks did not get to go last year, the more burden that they can go this year. It's opened up with a new program the, uh, for the young people, the Great American Diner, and um, it cost to be $300 per camper. And uh, we began our registration this week. Thank you for thank you, folks that got, got on to that so quick. Miss Amy, uh, Jessica, Miss Hope, whoever. I do appreciate that. Uh, 24 young people already, I believe, 24, 25 registered. Uh, about six boot campers. So about 30 young people from our church. And um, and every here, and then uh, the sponsors are are registered in, I believe. Um, if you're interested in going, we'd love to have you go, but we have to register. You. We need to register you this week. Almost everything's closed at the camp for uh, almost for every week, almost except for the first and last week, which are difficult schedules for people in school. I'd like to request the people. I don't know what our Work's going to take to fix our lines in the basement. I've got that in mind. At some time in the spring, things are drier. Whatever it's going to take, it's going to take us a little bit of finances, I believe, to uh, repair the church basement. But I do still want to take the young people to camp, and I'm going to just try to do our best to help donate towards that in the next couple weeks or months. And if you can donate towards it, say so I'll help one of the young people go on as much as given a. Um, if it's a non-church member that are coming as a friend, we're going to ask them to pay their entire amount. But church kids, we'd like to pay as much of as we can. You've, vest, you've invested in the buildings. You've invested in our mis, um, missions program. You've invested in keeping the lights on. You've paid the pastor's salary. All that I'm super grateful for. But my burden is to send all the, is not to put a big financial burden, but to invest in the young people going to camp. I believe it would be well worth it. I hope, hope we can give towards that. John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. <clears throat> and supper being ended... The devil, having now put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, <coughs> excuse me, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. I believe that's the idea, that he tucked it into his belt or wrapped it around his waist, a towel. And after that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. 
short word of prayer. You pray with me. Let's remember Miss Jean Parson and all the family this in, that's involved in the, hearing the news of the passing of her sisters just before the morning service. You pray with me as I lead in prayer. Dear fathers, we come to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, so many things to ask for. But we have not, if we ask not. And Lord, in your perfect will, we ask for your blessings on our service. We pray that the expenses for the youth camp, Lord, would be met. And the young folks can go, Lord, and, and to go uh, affordably, Lord. I pray for that. Then, Lord, I'm thinking of Miss Lana Ellison. I pray that you bless her this morning. Think of Miss Melvin at home. I pray that you be with her. Then Miss Jean and family, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is very evident. Lord, I pray for Jack. Lord, I pray your, your Lord, your way would, would lead him un, unto you. Lord, I then ask for our message here. These few moments may we be astonished at Jesus. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Several weeks ago, as actually before this morning's message, drawn to a couple of thoughts. When Brother Mark was speaking, it was in John chapter 1. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then not only the thoughts of his creation, all things were made by him, without him was not anything made that was made. The power of the Word that was God. And then by the time you get to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This all-powerful existing God all creation. And then there's a verse or two in between there that says, and in him was light, and this light was the life of men, or light of men. As to many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. That's all connected. That he gave us power to become the sons of God is not just the idea that he gave us permission, as sometimes people like to read it. That, okay, I give you, I give you the permission. I give you, but it is the idea that in his word he gives the authority. But the passage says as him and him was light. It's the energy. It's the power. And that light and that power and energy of the, of the word of God is the light and energy. It's the power that makes us the sons of God. He can turn us on. You know, and I think of that. It amazes me, this all-powerful God became flesh and dwelt among us. I come in this astonishing words. We're close to it. Look at John 7, verse 45. It's a simple little outline. I'm going to go his words, his works, and then his witness. Uh, his words, his works, and I'm just going to share briefly about them. My time is more limited in his second service, but John 7, verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? Why don't you lay hands on Jesus and bring him in here to the council? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered the Pharisees and said, Are you also deceived? <laughs> Has he fooled you? What did he say that you, we, we sent you out with orders to bring him in? Why didn't you? And their, their answer was, We've never heard anybody speak like this. Their answer in the other Gospels was, he speaks as one that hath authority. See, all they're used to from the Pharisees, all they're used to from the scribes, and it even said in the passage from last week, he spoke not as the scribes. They were always contesting. They had different schools of rabbinical teaching, and this rabbi taught this, and this rabbi taught this, and these folks followed this one, and these folks followed that one. And yeah, even within their own scribes and Pharisees, they had their denominations. They had their, all had their different interpretations. But all of them, I said, were contesting the Old Testament scriptures. They were contradicting the Old Testament scriptures. They were challenging the Old Testament. They were critical of the Old Testament scriptures. See, the Sadducees, which were leaders of the Jews and were a religious order in themselves, but some say they would be the more liberal, moderate. They didn't even believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in a spiritual realm of angels. Well, they'd, they'd have to deny some really clear passages in the Old Testament. So the people of this day being brought up in that era, that culture, even in religious circles, when they heard Jesus speak, they said, he speaks with one with authority. 
What he says is not contested. Uh, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. He's not, he's not just sharing an opinion. And we realize in John 14, um, or John chapter 1, because he's the word. Have you ever said, and that's the final authority? Have you ever heard someone say, and, and, and that's, you know, that's my word, that, that's the bond. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, don't turn to it for time, it says, and God said, let there be. So do you talk about high and can't attain unto it? How, as we read in Colossians chapter 1, as we read in John chapter 1, as we read in Hebrews chapter 1 and in Hebrews chapter 11, that the worlds were framed by the word of his mouth. How can God speak in all 103 or 108, was it, that, all 108 elements come into existence? How can God speak then and in days of order organize them and put them into design? How can God speak and there be a galaxy? How can he speak and one galaxy be 25 trillion light years from the other one? How can God speak and there be well, 80,000 different insects? And the same with insects and the same God speak and there be the great blue well and the mammals. How can God speak and there be all the different designs of or the 6,000 different mammals, or there be of the, of the um, trees, there be another 60,000 plus of those, and then of the plants, there be another 800,000 of those. How can he speak and there be a daffodil and a solar system? That's one powerful word, right? Matter of fact, since I can't comprehend it, it's just, as, as I put in the title, that's astonishing. So a lot of news comes on, and they use the word, because of shocking news coming out of. Now, what is really gets me most is when it's in the sports world, and somebody in the welterweight class of the UFC says, I shocked the world. Shoot, I didn't even know about it. I don't even know his name. And you know, and maybe a couple of years back, an underdog in the Super Bowl, and they all come and say, we shocked everyone. Well, not really. I don't even remember who you were. What year you won. And when they, and I, I'm sad to say this, but there's so much news, and there's so much even bad news, say this is a shocking revelation. It doesn't even hardly shock us anymore. If I think about the same Jesus created the little red ant or the little red fire ant on a mound in Florida, is the same Jesus who called in the Adamara strain or the Adam uh, galaxy. I can't hardly comprehend it. That's just astonishing. That's amazing. So I'll just share that about that. This is astonishing words. And so don't be, don't be, <laughs> in Revelation chapter 19, where John says, Behold, I saw heaven open and a great white horse. And every army of the world is gathered in the valley of decision. And I don't even know what armaments they'll have, but they're going to think they're something. I'm amazed when third world countries have their May Day or military parades North Korea exhibits all their nuclear power in these big, massive parades. And I'm wondering how a country that's steeped in such poverty was able to make that. Except their people are starving. And then Russia has their Red Square May Day, and they parade out all. And now, now the super uh, aircraft carriers of China has now are parading the South Sea and the China Sea. And you look at that and say, whoa, there's 7,000 men on that ship, you know, right there. And it's got... It's, powered by its own nuclear reactor. They can pull that ship up outside of Singapore and they can power that city with that, with that nuclear reactor on that boat. I shouldn't say boat, that ship. And they can power it for a year. It's amazing. I don't know what, armies, what the armies of the world will have when they gather and all these military forces gather outside of Jerusalem and they say, we are going to get rid of Israel. 
and on a horse. Jesus with his word melts them. And the blood flows to the bridles of the horses for, for the valley of Jordan. Because the, the, the God, the word that spoke this world into existence with that same word is going to end it. Now, isn't that amazing? Well, astonishing words. If I didn't get it on that, how about his works? Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 38. Well, it's just stopping everyone singing a chorus. What a mighty God we serve. I, don't know, I haven't heard that for a while. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. He can do that with his word. How about if he goes to doing some miracles and some works. Mark 4, verse 38. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Jesus asleep while the storm throwing that ship around. Just about five years ago, now that I'm saying that, probably put Larry to work again, get back. They found a Galilean shipping vessel. And a transport vessel, what they think was more like a ferry that used going back and forth to go across the Sea of Galilee. Some could hold 12, some could hold 24 people. One of those type ships that, of all things, or boats that we've discovered now, we realize Jesus is asleep. Winds are tossing that ship all around, that boat, if you think of it. And then the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that, that we perish? Oh, they needed to read Psalms chapter 139. It says, no matter where you are on the water, no matter if it's even in the darkness, it's light to him. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. I'm just telling you, I'm reading this. You know what I'm thinking? I'm waiting for my phone to buzz. Can't, is that sad that I'm thinking of that? Uh, and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And they said... And he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? Good question, huh? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him? We got an idea, and the word became flesh. I read in the New Testament, Jesus could speak to a tree, and the tree dry up before the next day, <laughs> be dead. I read in the scriptures, Jesus could speak to the fish, and you say, what do you mean speak to the fish? Well, he'd tell the fellows, cast your nets on the other side, and they'd throw them on the other side, and Jesus had a school of fish there waiting for him. Then it came to taxation, and they said, well, to show that we'll pay tribute to whom tributes do, and there won't be any criticism of the Lord and his obedience to the laws of the land, but Peter, go fishing, and Jesus could bring a fish that had a gold coin in his mouth. That seems kind of small, but that's kind of big. He could speak to the, well, and if the children didn't praise him, he said, and if they didn't, to fulfill scriptures, the rocks would cry out. I don't even know how much farther you can go with this, but here we have the sea. Now I know it's the Galilean Sea, Sea of Gennesaret as we know it. It's moderately shallow sea, has some deeper holes on north end and south end from what I read. I think it's approximately 11 miles to 13 miles at its very widest part apart. So with the winds coming over the, the mountain range that separates it from the Mediterranean Sea, so these winds would come across that mountain range, come on the Mediterranean, and they'd come across that mountain range, it'd be real volatile. They'd have a storm warning, you know, within like three minutes from calm to storm, you know. Seems like it was always a troubled sea. Now they're they're afraid they're going to perish. And Jesus gets up and says, peace be still. Now the fellows on the boat got the experience. They know why it just went flat. I've always wondered what the kid or someone in another boat or someone on the shore thought. What a storm tonight. What in the world just happened? Don't you? But those on... Those on the ship would say, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey his voice? Where else can you go in the scriptures? Who could take five loaves and two fishes? Say, let's have a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for the meal we're about to all partake. Voila! And now go pick up the leftovers. One time, 12 baskets. The next time, seven. With thousands of people fed. Where did it come from? How? As you break it, where, well, wouldn't you want to keep your eyes on that? Pick up the... Hey, take those six water barrels. Fill them with water. Or take them six barrels. Fill them with water. Man, I'm telling you what, knowing what was happening, Jesus would say, now serve it to the governor of the feast. Man, I want to I just keep looking at it. I want to I see it happen, you know. And it's changed to wine. Here comes the widow of Nain out of town with her mourners and her, and her son on the buyer. Jesus halts it, tells him to get up. You know what death is, don't you? Have you ever just sit there and pondered and looked at people that you dearly loved and seen what death has done to them? That enemy, that great enemy. And you look and you say, man, could you imagine Jesus coming in and saying, Lazarus, wait, don't open it. Don't move that stone. He's been dead four days. He's, he's, a, he's set on the corruption. Move the stone. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, come hopping out of there. Move those clothing for him. You, you, don't, you don't put grave clothes on a live person. Everywhere I look in the scriptures, and I'm just mentioning those, right down to the sea, it's astonishing what Jesus did. Now, take those, his words and his works, and go to the passage we were in, John 13. And this witness. And the supper being ended, verse 2, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Witness number one, how could Judas have heard those words and seen those works, and for lack of a better way to say it, and miss the message. And yet, all around us are people seeing the, the witness of creation. They're seeing the witness of a very specific design. They're seeing the failure of evolution. Matter of fact, a recent article, the hoax of evolution, the falsification of the dinosaur to bird thing with the China Smithsonian National Geographic hoax and found that they fabricated that. The hoax of the Peking man that they took pig bones and made a jaw and said it was a, and the hoax of the uh, Australopithecus man where they took bones from a grave site 50 miles away and then added it to a chimpanzee bone. Said, the hoax, the lying of it to try and find one missing link and the, the, the testimony is this, the fossils still say no. There are no, not one single transitional form not one and the testimony of creation how are so many people missing it the works of God the word of God how are they missing it Judas I look at him and wonder experienced the sea of Gennesaret Experience the feeding of the 5,000. Experience Lazarus from the grave. Experience the widow of Nain. Experienced everything else is not named. And I'm pretty sure since he sent them forth with the power to heal themselves, he experienced, if not stood back and watched his compatriots, the others, as they healed in village after village and cast out demons and healed people, experienced and was part of it. And Satan entered his heart to betray Jesus. Now, folks, that's astonishing. That's, that's a wonder to me. That's witness number one. And then we come, let's go down at your John chapter 13. And, after, and he rises, verse four, and he rises from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. 
And after that, he poured th water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. He deals with Peter. Something about, I think, in verse 31, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, him, Now the Son of Man is glorified. The who went out from that was Judas Iscariot. So I am just wanted to jump ahead and say this. Judas got his feet washed too. And as Jesus rises, knowing his hours come, that he be betrayed and he's going to the Father. He's going to the grave. He's going to Calvary in the grave. Resurrection. He knows that that hour's come. This last thing he does is wash and dry the apostles' feet. I read down through this passage and I realize what I do now, you know not. Peter, you're going to have to let me do it. What I do now, you don't know not. But afterwards you'll know. Peter said, well, if you don't wash my feet, wash me all over. Jesus said, you don't need washed all over, just your feet. And I know there is a Levitical, I know there is a scriptural principle to that, that... Well, there's the washing of all over, the washing of regeneration. It makes us clean with all, clean with it. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. We don't need to be born again and rewashed completely from our sins. But in the areas of our service, we can get our feet dirty. And there's something else that is to this too. Jesus said, and as I have done, so in comparison or likeness of that, do you also one another. In Christ, and knowing he's going to Calvary, with his great humility, the creator of the world is washing the dirty feet of Peter and Jude, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Andrew, the other Judas who wasn't Iscariot, and Jesus and Judas himself. He's washing and drying their feet. Another person passed away just re recently and been on some little, little specials. In 1969, Mr. Rogers had this man as a guest on his program. It was Officer Francis Clemens. Before I give it away, if you didn't see it, didn't see the special, you know Mr. Rogers. Won't you be my neighbor? It's a beautiful day at the neighborhood. The Supreme Court had ruled in 1969, took them seven years after the 62 ruling of, or 63 equal rights thing, and so they ruled that public pools could now be unsegregated. That means that, that black children could swim in a public pool. Oh, it created such an uproar, riots, people protesting. You know what Mr. Rogers did? He ran a program, put a wading pool on his program, and invited Officer Clemens to sit with him and put his feet in the pool. Officer Clemens was a black policeman. And Mr. Rogers, when they were done, got a towel and dried his feet. They re-aired that program in 1993. Folks, a lot of folks didn't get it. But when you looked and realized the stand he was taking and the compassion he was showing and the love he was showing, you'd had to stay back and go, my goodness, Mr. Rogers, what a man. By no means a sissy. I was a real man. And I see Jesus knowing that he's going to Calvary to die for sinful man. And knowing he's going to Calvary and humbled himself even unto the death of the cross. He's going to get spit on. I bring message again. You know, all these things happen to him. I find it astonishing that the great creator is washing the, the sturdy feet of humanity. So it's so high. It's so wonderful. I can't attain unto this. But make no mistake. It's astonishing the grace of God that in the ages to come we should show forth the exceeding riches of his grace that Jesus loved me and loved you. Amen. The astonishing Jesus. Message one, first service, and this one. 
his word and the power of it, his works, his miraculous works, and then the witness that that Jesus stooped down here for you and I. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear fathers, we close in prayer. May the Lord's day have been a good day to honor and think of you. May 2021, uh, you be preeminent in all our ministry and life, we pray. Thank you for loving us and saving us. We are so grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do it.